Warning, this podcast contains swearing and sounds of exorcisms that some listeners may find disturbing. When a human being is possessed by a yes. demon, what is the purpose of the possession of an individual? The destruction of that individual's soul to such a point that it must end up in hell. That if there is a demon in your life and he dictates your behavior at least in one province of life, one area of life, he can only be expelled by direct confrontation. Episode 2 Principal Photography and Netflix. What audiences don't realise when they're watching content is the extreme difficulty involved in raising the required funds to make it in the first place. And that's across all genres. It's not an excuse, but it was a fight from start to finish, and it took the producers nearly four years to raise the funds for the documentary, with the help of Screen Island, Northern Ireland Screen, and several other contributors. Nevertheless, it was promising to be a jam-packed two weeks of filming in America in March of 2015. My very first interview in America was actually with Bob Kaiser at his hospice in Phoenix, Arizona. He'd called me the week before, insisting that I get over to see him quick, as he was dying. Now, I knew Maliki Martin had his first share of critics, and this was one who was actually committed to going on camera. So I rocked up to his hospice with Kat, our US field producer. As I began to set up the interview on a patio area of the hospice, Bob was wheeled out in his chair by his carer, hooked up to his oxygen tank. He was a gentleman, but I was taken aback by the core hatred that he still retained for Maliki as the interview went on. It, it appealed to his romantic nature to have a romantic tale to tell. Uh, and he, he did very well. He sold a few books, more than a few. On one hand, you could say he was always interested in the most sensational story that he could make up. On the other hand, there are those who think that he, Malachi Martin himself, was somewhat possessed by the devil. And for him to cast himself in the role of a, someone who could cast devils out was a really neat trick. Bob Kaiser actually died two weeks after filming, and although I'm still heavily criticised for having him featured in the film, I don't regret giving him an opportunity to voice his opinion, and I stand by that decision to this day. I only wished I had a few other critics that were willing to come on camera at the time, to help balance out the opinions on Maliki. Trust me, there was plenty of keyboard warriors out there flinging their mud. Misrepresentation, falsehood, and imagination going berserk, all in the elaboration and defence of a particular thesis. Well, you know what Ben Johnson said when somebody wrote similar uh, words, or said similar words about a work of his. He said, when a gentleman throws mud at me, I know he has only got mud to throw. As I was in the general area, it was only right to call in to see the legendary Art Bell at his house. We got there a bit early, so we parked up outside his grounds, and it wasn't long until a drone was flying overhead checking us out. After a previous attack on Art Bell's home, it was only right that he was taking precautions. Art Bell and his wife were extremely accommodating him. He moved into his home recording studio for the interview. I was blessed at what was about to happen, as Art hardly ever agreed to conduct interviews. Okay, Art Bell interview, take one. I never met the man in person, but I interviewed him for countless hours on the radio. I was very fortunate, and uh, we became close friends, and I don't think you could listen to Malachi and not have a strong opinion one way or the other. I would classify myself as an agnostic, but Malachi affected me deeply. He was aware of the full contents of the third secret of Fatima, and he shared some of those that I cannot share with you or anybody because because I promised. Uh, What he did say, if you want something chilling, is that try and imagine the very worst thing that you can imagine. We live now in the day of ISIS and terrorism and people getting burned alive, and so one can imagine some pretty bad stuff. He said, imagine the very worst you can imagine, and then I will tell you that it's going to be much worse than that. So there are many things like that that he said to me that will never leave my mind and will probably worry me to the grave. So 
So I brushed off the Nevada dust and headed to the apartment in Brooklyn to wait for the main crew to arrive. This consisted of Chris and Paddy, our two producers, and director of photography, Rory O'Brien. A pretty slimmed down team, which is how I like it. We filmed a lot with Robert during the first week of filming. On the east coast of America, just had a massive dump of snow, which looked absolutely beautiful on camera. Especially when we travelled deep into the Connecticut woodlands, the home of Father Kumaswamy. The location of Father Martin's last exorcism of the four-year-old girl. It also happened to be quite an emotional experience for Robert, who hadn't been back since the event happened nearly 16 years ago. Jesus. The funny thing is I just thought I'd be a whole lot calmer. My heart's racing like a goddamn drum. We pulled in. Their van was right there. It wasn't. It actually was a Ford Explorer. And I, we drove up, and I just said to Maliki, I said, "Is that them?" Because they were milling about. I said, "They're not supposed to be here." And he didn't. He didn't say anything. And, I, and at, at that point, I just knew by the look on his face, that was them. And I and I saw the child. And then the first thing she did was she just glanced at us driving in and then looked away like we were no one of consequence. Whatever you want. Well, all right, great. Excuse me. Oh, fucking crybaby. Oh, careful, gents, it's ice. When we got back to the Brooklyn apartments and began to play back the footage, we noticed something interesting on the shots of Robert's Jeep arriving at the house. When I sped up the files from the two cameras, we noticed a large dark shadow in the wood line following the Jeep on its five minute journey from the top of the road to the driveway of the house. Now the skeptical ones amongst us put it down to chance, but it was creepy as the shadow never went ahead of the vehicle, it always remained behind it. Okay, can you first of all introduce yourself and tell me what made you fall into this type of work, line of work? Uh, my name is Jim Petzanito, and uh, I've always been interested in the uh, anything supernatural since I was a kid. I've had an experience when I was a child, and I've always, uh, I'm always in search of the unexplained. Jimmy Petanito, aka Mr. Haunted, was another one of those contributors that had been extremely involved from the start. I did not know what to expect. I expected, honestly, I expected maybe like one vehicle with two guys with a camera. And I think there was three or four trucks came in the snow, parked in my driveway. Guys coming out with cameras, microphones, boxes of I don't know what. So to me, it was a big crew. It, I was terrified, Marty. Why, why were you terrified? Because you'd never done it before? or I've never done anything like that before. Had me sit in the chair and there's lights in my face and cameras. I never, never experienced that before. I was terrified. You feel like a gerbil in a, on the headlights. <laughs> I, felt like, I felt like a little tropical fish at the dentist office that everybody's looking at. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy reminisced about the first encounter with Malachi and like Ralph Sartre, Jimmy had hours of unseen archive with Malachi and also with the Warrens. This was due to the fact that he was an early member and videographer of Ed and Lorraine Warren's investigation teams. So he had a treasure trove of footage in his basement that he happily donated for the documentary. Now, there's some critics out there that suggested that I sensationalized the audio in the documentary, but believe it or not, all the noises and sounds came straight from Jimmy's footage. Jesus Christ, what is your name? Christ command you. Obviously, I've thanked you before, but that was, I want to thank you again. That was we literally could not have made that film without your material, and also Ralph Sarchi's archive as well, which was which was just invaluable, as you as, as you can see when you watch the film. 
totally honored to uh, contribute. Ralph Sarchi had agreed to meet us in a cafe for his interview. It was during this film and that we connected some of the dots with regards to what happened to the four-year-old girl after Maliki Martin's encounter. It was believed then that Ralph and his own team had picked up the same case four years later. This, this particular case was definitely on a different level and I do hope that she did find the relief that she sought. And most of all, I hope that her soul belongs to God at this moment, no matter what her physical condition is. I hope that her soul belongs to God. During our production, we received information that the girl since had committed suicide, but we couldn't confirm what happened to this girl. This was Ralph's reaction to hearing the news. We believe she killed herself when she was a teenager. She took her own life. Yeah. That's we found. We had this investigation on the girl, so it's poor girl. Sorry, dude. You gotta give me a minute on that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can't spring that shit on me yeah. and yeah. expect me to talk about it. It's not, it's not, it's not fact though, yeah, it's not but, proven. You know, um, it's gonna make me wanna go home and call now to find out. It's a cute little girl too. Yeah. It's gotta be the same one. So let's... Yeah. You, Ralph Sarchi. Give me one of you. Ralph's reaction to me proved how much he puts into his cases and how genuine he is as a religious demonologist. We had so many contrary reports that the girl was alive, the girl wasn't alive. It was irresponsible for me to try and close off the story in the documentary. I just didn't have the full truth. And I'm still looking for that truth to this day. At the end of the interview, Ralph asked me who I had contacted for interview. I mentioned that I'd left a few messages with paranormal investigator John Zaffis, the nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren, and I knew he had some sort of connection with Maliki Martin, but nothing was confirmed. He told me to leave it with him to organise and by the next day we had an official interview with John at his own home. Both Robert and Jimmy had asked to tag along for this as well. Okay, ready? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Over in this corner of the museum, I have a lot of the different things that have been moved from more of the heavier duty cases. Uh, people using things in occult rituals and doing a lot of different types of uh, practices. A lot of my religious statues here, as we know in uh, different practices and different cultures, they use the saints and they use it as a disguise and they do things behind the scenes to be able to cover things up. So if you're looking at a wide variety of a lot of different things that are used in practices, that's definitely what has transpired over here in this corner. And there's there's uh, actually a dolls down here that people have done things with and attached things to it. Now, with this corner, the majority of the stuff is what I call a deliberate attempt. What I mean by that, it's not just a haunted item where something attached to it. These things were deliberately summoned and done with ritual intent and attached to these items to cause some type of um, to cause some type of paranormal activity behind the scenes by giving these things to individuals and they wouldn't even realize what was going on or what was happening. Amber and Maureen Gardner in Atlanta were interested to speak to us about Maliki Martin. And Cecile, Maureen's sister, was writing his biography. And apparently Maliki had sent her a shoebox full of photographs and memorabilia. And Maureen had this in her basement in Atlanta. I know he wanted her to work for him. And she was concerned that she wouldn't be able to transition from a small city in the West to New York City. And she was concerned about that. But she wanted to promote him. She felt like the whole world should know about him. So she did promote him in the ways that she could. She got him on the Art Bell radio show, and she was very busy on the telephones back in New Mexico. She, I know she admired him, and she wanted to work for him, and he wanted her to work for him as well, but it just never came to fruition. People always ask me about my own faith and whether it was tested, whether I came to some sort of spiritual reckoning or, or had life-changing moments. And by the end of the process of making the film, I was still on that fence. I'm just as objective and skeptical about my experiences than the next person. But throughout that six year journey of making the film, I did encounter a few strange occurrences. Sometimes it sounded like little girl's feet running across the landing at home. I could hear a young girl crying at night or crying in an adjacent room. One night, my eldest Labrador began to bark at something invisible in the corner of the room. Then he pinned me down in some sort of protective posture while he watched this invisible presence in the room. I sometimes saw a woman hanging from the landing when I was locking up at night. Don't get me wrong, I did think someone was trying to spook me or hinder my progress in the project, but I carried on regardless. It wasn't a macho thing or an arrogant thing or a heroic thing, it was just, this was my first film and I'd promised the powers that be that I'd deliver a film 
within budget and within time frame. And I always had Chris, the producer's inspiring words in my head. Don't F this up, Marty. I headed into Dublin, into Windmill Lane Studios, with two hard drives under my arm. John, the editor, asked me what I'd like to edit first. And for me, it had to be the main event of the film. Robert returning to the house of Malachi Martin's last exorcism. If we couldn't get that sequence right, then we were doomed. John's patience and skills shone through as we chopped and changed and moved and rejigged the structure. After our first screening with our main funder, Screen Island, it was obvious that I was trying to make a film about Malachi Martin and about exorcism at the same time. And it was clear there wasn't enough room for both. So the three producers, Rachel, Chris and Paddy, gave me a decision. Is this a documentary about Malachi Martin? Or is this a documentary about exorcism? So I took the dogs for a walk and rang a writer friend of mine about my dilemma. His response was this. Go back to your first meeting with Paddy and Chris when they asked you to be part of the team. What were your first thoughts then? And it was great advice, as my initial reaction was, how come nothing had been made about this man before? So there it was. And with the help of Rachel, producer and co-writer, she helped me restructure the story on paper. Two weeks on and the film was finished. And the big push now was for the producers to get it screened and to generate sales interest. The truth is, whether we like it or not, the devil does exist. He can influence, and he does influence. Exorcism then is a healing, and it's a very horrid healing, but it does heal. Because inside there are living hell. It's a living hell. Anybody who exposes a devil is in danger. The word of God is the truth. The devil does not want people hearing the word of God. Satan is having his last stand. This is his Waterloo, where he's going to destroy as much as he can before he finally is shoved out of the abyss again, chained by Michael. We did not talk an awful lot about his exorcisms, except the last one. I kept asking him not to do it, and he kept saying, well, I'm only going to be an assistant. <laughs> not much chance of that. I still believe that Maliki was the target and not that little girl. She was the bait. We're talking about a four-year-old child. She was innocence personified. There was no reason why this kid should have been afflicted in this way. And he was called by Christ to do these things. He was a great mythomaniac. He was just a, a liar and a scoundrel and a cheat. He's a warrior. He was a warrior for God and he still is a warrior for God. He's a very, very sophisticated spirit who are there to harm us. And there we are. The world premiere of the documentary was planned for Friday the 26th of August 2016 at London Fright Fest Film Festival. So we were going to premiere at Fright Fest and it was quite a big build up for us. It was the the, the festival that we had hoped to premiere at. So we, a lot of us had travelled over to London. Um, the night before I was, uh, I think it was about half twelve, we received a, a, a letter via email, of course, which was a cease and desist. That letter came in and it said to us that we were not allowed to to show at Fright Fest. We were not allowed to show globally. And that was because a producer in the US had approached us about two months before and tried to get the film rights off us. We had refused him the film rights. And he claimed then uh, that night that he owned the, the life rights to John's office, who was one of our interviewees. Uh, as it turned out, he, there was some sort of contract between them, but it wasn't life rights. So alongside our distributors at the time, we decided that we would go ahead. Uh, and we did. Uh, I've never heard anything from him again. Now, there's no harsher critic than a horror audience. And the film was received with mixed reviews. And gradually it dawned on me that we totally had packaged the film wrong. If you were to watch the trailer, you would be inclined to think that the film was a horror doc, when in fact it was more biographical than anything. But as a filmmaker, you learn to take it on the chin. Let's fast forward to the Netflix sale, as the less I talk about our sales partners, the better. The four-year worldwide Netflix license was sealed at Cannes, and the world premiere was scheduled for the 15th of January, 2017. I was up at midnight on the 14th, refreshing the documentary section on my Netflix account. No sign of the film. Panic set in until I typed the title into my remote control. 
and there it was, in the deepest corners of their documentary section, under a subheading of satanic stories. And it was strange that they paid quite a lot of money for the license, but still made it difficult for you to locate the film. Anyway, it had a global distribution and all parties were happy. As a filmmaker, you need to have thick skin. And just like Maliki Martin, the film had mixed reviews. People loved the film or they hated it. I was criticised for being too sensational with the film, too biased, not sensational enough, too critical, not critical enough. I mean, it's a no-win situation, but it's important that you walk away from that edit suite feeling proud of what you've made, and we all were. I recently caught up with Chris and Paddy and asked them the same question presented in the documentary. Was Maliki Martin a truth teller or a sociopath? I mean, when we made the film, we were... Uh, it was it was a good uh, five, six years in, and now it's maybe 10 years in after the film's been released. And still, it is so hard to put a, a, a finger on the man and say exactly what he was. Was he uh, telling the truth? Was he a sociopath or a complete liar? I think it's impossible to know unless you were in the room with him now. And even then, in some of the interviews I've seen and heard, I don't think you'd know either. From our point of view, I guess some of it was true and some of it wasn't. The problem for us is we can't quite tell what that was. And I guess that's all in the mind of the, the audience for the doc or the reader of the book or whichever way you access Maliki's work. It's all up to your own personal faith as to whether you believe or you don't. He is an enigma, which is sort of uh, mirrors religion in itself. You know, can you believe what's in front of you or can you not? You know, I think this is... This is evidence for both. Yeah. I think he lives in his own world. I don't, you know, I, I don't know if we ever got really to the bottom of, you know, his departure from the Vatican. And we're probably never going to get to the bottom of that. You know, the church are not going to tell us. No. I don't think anybody can argue the fact that we met a lot of people who felt that he did them a lot of good. And that needs to be applauded. I don't know what would happen to somebody like him in this day and age. But it was a different time, and he was a man of his time. And... I think we did the right thing in making the film, without question. And I think the... We started out making probably a piece of entertainment, but I think we've made something that's educational. And I, people always say, oh, it's, it's a religious film, I'm not interested. No, it's not a religious film, it's a film that has a lot of religion in it. It's not a horror film, but you know what? People get scared by it. Um, I think we did a job of work. Proud of it. Very proud of it. I don't think when anybody starts making a film, they think that five years later they're still going to be doing the same film. And that certainly wasn't on our radar. You know, once you push the train off the top of the hill, you can't just push it back up. Mm. And you need to be, it's, it's, it's the same for any any creative project. You need to have the conviction to carry it through till the end. And the end of this wasn't going to happen in two weeks. Yeah. This podcast will give me an opportunity to play interview sound bites from contributors that we couldn't use in the film and Maliki storylines that we were unable to go down due to the limited time frame that we had. And it would only be right to finish on the words from the main man himself. If anybody has any coin of faith in their pockets, let them take it out and polish it up. We need to be on our knees in front of our creator. And we need to acknowledge him. We need positive acknowledgement of God because the time's coming on us are not going to be pleasant.